Welcome to another episode of Citizen Detective. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Morford. My friends call me Morph. I host several true crime podcasts, including Criminology, The Murder of My Family, Missing Persons, and Zodiac Speaking. If you want to leave us a voicemail about tonight's case or any of the cases we cover, we'd love to hear from you, and we may play it on the air. Simply head over to speakpipe.com slash citizen detective to let us know what's on your mind and... With that, I'm going to turn you over to Alex. Thanks, Morph. I'm Alex Ralph, researcher and writer for Citizen Detective and the doc show Murder Was the Case. I'm a law grad with 15 years experience in criminal law. I've worked both prosecution and defense in homicide cases and on other violent crime cases. I just want to let everyone know where to find us. We are live on YouTube, twitch.tv slash citizen detective twitter.com slash citizen d pod and facebook.com slash citizen detective podcast hey everyone i'm dr lee meller aka doc murder my show is murder was the case i've also written seven books cold north killers canadian serial murder understanding necrophilia homicide of forensic psychology text um, case book i um I'll just leave it at there for now. And I want to encourage you to go to patreon.com slash citizen detective and become a member of the DDA. What's the DDA? It's the digital detective agency. It is the support network for citizen detective. What we want to do with this show is we want to get you guys involved, more involved. You're doing better, but this is going to work. It's going to be a lot more fun if it, if it's back and forth between us. So join the DDA and Immediately what you get, you get to watch the scrum, which is sort of the after hours part of the show we do along with other perks. So that will be fantastic. We actually got a message on SpeakPipe, like uh, Morph was saying, uh, related to a case we did a few, um, I think a couple months back in November. So we're going to play that and then Alex is going to respond to that. Alex does all of our research. So she's the one to go to with all the facts. And it mostly pertains to that. Is this the, the Roberson case, Alex? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. The Let's Jeanette Robertson case. Yeah. I have a question about the Jeanette Robertson case. I actually have about four, but I'll start with one for right now. If Carl Johnson arrived midday of the midday of the murder with the gerbil and asked, where's Jen? David, the owner, said he didn't know, but Elvin, Jeanette's husband, had been in twice that day. Okay, now, according to Jenny Decker's book, the testimony obtained from Flossie years later, she said that Elvin hadn't been in at all. Which is it? And I'm not, I'm not suspecting Elvin by any means, but why is there the difference? This isn't one time, it was said two times, whereas Flossie said he wasn't in there at all. Can you provide clarification on this? Um, my research, including an episode that Morph did on his show, uh, that was on murder in my family when you had yeah. Lana on there. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I came across several stories and I, what I went by was that Alvin had come in there multiple times that day. So I don't know why I, I perused Jenny Decker's book, um, but I tried to use as many sources that could be corroborated with other sources. 
And so that's what, you know, that's my understanding is that he had been in there multiple times. And if I would welcome any documents or links that you could send me, um, especially testimony, things like that, that are on the record as stating facts that are otherwise, and we can make clarifications, certainly. Were these all secondary sources, Alex? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's tricky unless you've got primary source stuff. I did research. I was mentioning my book, Cold North Killers, and I saw that there was a name of a victim of you know one of the hundreds of victims I talked about in that book. And every newspaper spelt the name Kathy with a C, except one that spelt it with a K. And I said, well, they're not all going to be wrong except for that one. That one must have just got it wrong. Turned out to be the other way around. Everyone got it wrong except the one newspaper that got it right. So the methodology of how consistent it is across sources, also uh, pretty questionable. But you know, in the absence of primary sources, that's what you got. Right. A 40, 40 year case, 40 year old case without the actual documented uh, police reports and stuff. It's kind of open to, you know, people forgetting or mixing things up or uh, and then you have this. Well, what which was it? That kind of thing. It's also when you're trying to tell a story, you know, you, you, there's an inclination to go with an engaging fact, even if it's if, if you're sitting on the fence yourself and you're going, I can't tell whether it's true or not. And you don't have all the time in the world. There's always a, a pull to be like, well, I'll put in it in if it makes it more interesting. Yeah. So with that, uh, we answered the Hopefully question. Hopefully we answered the question. Yes. Okay, cool. What do we got today? Well, before we jump Call into this picture. case, uh, we want to share some news with you. Citizen oh. Detective has its own website. And we're fancy now. So if you go to citizendetectivepodcast.com, you can find all the episodes of the show. You can leave comments on episodes that we can respond to. Uh, you can share your theories about cases we've covered and so on. And you can even leave the voicemails for us that we asked for right there on the website. You'll get all the latest news about the show, important updates, and you'll find links to our social media. And we'll also provide all the links that help you join us live here as we record each episode. So citizendetectivepodcast.com is really your one-stop shop for everything Citizen Detective. So be sure to check it out. So with that, let's get into tonight's case. And this is a, a big one. When we think about San Francisco serial killers in the 1970s, many of us think immediately of the Zodiac or perhaps the zebra killers come to mind targeting random citizens of the Bay Area for over a year. But a lesser known predator who also stalked the streets of San Francisco was a man that dubbed the Doodler. Between 1974 and 1975, five gay men were stabbed to death in cruising areas at or near San Francisco's Ocean Beach. Although the cases were investigated by police, they were overshadowed by other headline gramming cases like the Zodiac, the zebra killings, and the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. Eventually, two detectives known for their ability to navigate urban, urban subcultures took over the case. They discovered a rumor circulating through the gay community about an attractive young black man who had approached gay men in bars, sketching their portraits as a mean of seduction. The man was known in the bar scene as the doodler or the black doodler. Based upon the rumors, detectives located at least two witnesses who survived the tax and several individuals who fit the description given by those witnesses. One suspect remains a primary person of interest to this day. In recent years, San Francisco's cold case unit reactivated the Doodler investigation in an effort to not only solve the murders, but to rectify past wrongs in dealing with the gay community. San Francisco was a hotbed of the civil rights movement during the 60s and 70s. College students and followers of the hippie movement congregated in the Bay Area, protesting the Vietnam War and advocating for the equality of women and people of color. The city was also a mecca for the queer community during the 70s. As early as the 1940s, gay men migrated to San Francisco in droves, escaping intolerant states across the nation. Areas like the Castro, Tenderloin, and Polk Gulch catered to the gay population, 
and were home to gay bars, bathhouses, and other queer-friendly establishments. According to LGBTQ activist Ann Cronenberg, the bars were really the only places where queer people felt safe from violence and arrest. Despite the welcoming appeal of San Francisco, being gay was still illegal in California. A primary directive of the San Francisco Police Department was to stamp out homosexuality, arresting people suspected of being gay, engaging in gay activity, and even dressing in clothing deemed gender inappropriate. Gay men feared the police. SFPD regularly raided the bars and even the homes of known homosexuals, not just arresting the men, but often submitting them to severe beatings. Gay men were also the regular targets of beatings by civilian men and teenage boys. The assaults went largely unreported out of fear that the victims would themselves be arrested, their reputations ruined, and careers destroyed. Ocean Beach runs three and a half miles down the Pacific coast between the Pacific Ocean and the Upper Great Highway. The beach is filled with sand dunes containing walking paths and bike trails. Ocean Beach is an ideal spot for murder. Waves from the Pacific are big and strong with sneaky rip currents. The insulation of the dunes and the thundering roar of the sea drown out any noise, muffling screams, especially at night. At some time around 2 a.m. on January 27, 1974, an anonymous mail called San Francisco Police to report a dead body on Ocean Beach near Eulola Street. The caller wouldn't give his name, but had a uniquely high, soft voice. When police arrived at approximately 2.30, the rising tide had reached the body, pulling it closer and closer to the ocean. The victim lay on his back, parallel to the highway in the surf. Detective Frank Falzone, known for his involvement in the Zodiac and Night Stalker cases, was at bat for the city's next homicide and responded to the scene. It was nighttime and there was no street lamps uh, to light the area. Police pulled the body farther inland to prevent the waves from washing it out to sea. The victim was a balding, stocky, middle-aged man. He had no identification on him. Other than his clothing, the man wore a Timex watch and only had a few dollars in his pocket. The victim's body was covered in blood from multiple stab wounds to his torso. An autopsy revealed that the man had 17 stab wounds in his chest, back, and stomach, and defensive wounds on his hands. Based on the shapes and depths of the stab wounds, the coroner concluded that the assailant used two different knives in the attack. Crime scene investigators scoured the beach looking for clues. They photographed everything in the vicinity, yet they found no weapon and no evidence relating to the murder. The San Francisco Examiner published an article after the murder revealing the man's identity as Gerald Earl Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh lived in San Francisco, but was originally from Canada. Police uncovered few details about the victim. They did discover that he was 49 years old and previously worked at a mattress company in Montreal. Kevin Fagan, the reporter of San Francisco Chronicle and host of the podcast The Doodler, has devoted many hours to investigating the Doodler victims backgrounds, and finding little information on Gerald Cavanaugh. Police were unable to generate many any leads as to who killed Cavanaugh. They concluded that the motive was not robbery, but a random act of violence committed in a fit of rage. Also, based on the use of two different knives, police believe that the murder was not spontaneous. The attacker intended on murder that night. In the 1970s, Ocean Beach was popular was a popular cruising spot for gay men. And knowing this, investigators suspected that Kavanaugh was killed by someone he met on the beach and with whom he intended nothing more than a consensual sexual encounter. Five months later, on June 25th, 1974, an unnamed woman found a body at 34th and Fulton Streets, less than two miles from Kavanaugh. The body was underneath a tree near Spreckles Lake in Golden's, Golden Gate Park. The victim was a young man in his mid to late 20s. According to the San Francisco Examiner, there were five stab wounds to the victim's torso and blood in his mouth and nose. Golden Gate Park, like Ocean Beach, was a popular location for cruising. Men would use the beach areas to meet other men and use the bathrooms for sexual relations. Having no information regarding how, when, and why the victim ended up at Spreckles Lake, investigators suspected he met his killer while cruising in the park or came with the individual to have sex. The man was clothed. 
had no identification on him, and his pockets were empty. Police later identified him as 27-year-old Joseph Stevens, known in the LGBTQ community as Jay Stevens. Jay was a female impersonator. Although his sister believes Jay was likely transgender, dressing female from age six, Jay also presented as male when he was not on stage and was moving into regular gay stand-up comedy. For these reasons, we will use male pronouns when referring to Jay tonight. Jay was an up-and-coming star in the drag circuit of San Francisco. Friends and family members described Jay as beautiful, six foot two with blonde wavy hair, cheekbones for days, and huge doe eyes. Bay Area reporter Don McLean once said that Jay Stevens had a face that launched a thousand sailors. The summer of his death, Jay was booked to perform at the internationally renowned Finocchio's, a nightclub featuring female impersonators since the 1930s. The investigation into Jay's murder was short and produced no leads. Jay was last seen leaving the Cabaret Club on Montgomery Street in the North Beach area of the city. Witnesses saw him leave with someone, but they were unable to identify the individual. According to Detective Dan Cunningham, Jay's car was parked near Golden Gate Park on the night he was killed. Someone stole the car the next morning, the thief ending up in a high-speed chase with police before he crashed the car and escaped. The offender, who was Caucasian and blonde, was arrested and ruled out as a suspect in the murder. Based on where Jay's car was parked, police theorized that Jay drove himself to the park, possibly with the man who killed him. According to Kevin Fagan, police never followed up with Jay's family and quickly gave up on the investigation. On July 7, 1974, 10 days after the discovery of Jay Stevens, 49-year-old Tobo Weiss was walking her dog, Moondance, along Ocean Beach at approximately 4 a.m., the dog ran ahead of Taba and over the dunes. And when she caught up with him, Moondance was next to a dead body lying face down on the beach at the foot of Lincoln Way. She returned home and called the police. San Francisco detective Dave Toskey, best known for his work on the Zodiac case, was on call to respond. The body belonged to a younger male. The victim's throat was slashed in three places and stabbed at least 15 times. The man had no identification on him. Attempts at identification through fingerprints and dental records was unsuccessful. The, victor, the victim was fully clothed in a tan leather jacket, blue jeans, armed briefs, and black ankle sock boots. He had three rings on his fingers, one of which was, gold, was a gold wedding band. A search of the man's pockets revealed a tube of makeup, leading police to report that he had, quote, homosexual propensities. This was the third gay man killed by a vicious knife attack, and investigators saw a pattern. Gay men were being murdered in cruising spots, apparently in fits of rage. The Sentinel, the leading queer newspaper in San Francisco, followed the cases closely and published several articles about the crimes. Believing there was a killer targeting gay men, police appealed to readers of the newspaper in hopes someone would come forward with the latest victim's identity and information about his killer. Sixteen days after a July article, a man named Booker T. Williams identified the dead man as Klaus Christman, 31 years old. Christman was a German tourist who was living with Williams and his wife in San Francisco for three months before his death. He was married with two children and worked for Michelin in Germany. Williams was likely the last person to see Klaus alive. He told police that he saw police leave Bojangles Bar sometime in the late evening of July 6th or after midnight on the 7th. According to Kevin Fagan, Kloss was heading for another bar, the Shed, when he left Bojangles. Whether he ever arrived at that second bar is unknown. On May 12, 1975, a hiker stumbled across the body of a young male between Ulo and Vic Vincente streets in the sand dunes of Ocean Beach. The location was less than 500 feet from where Gerald Cavanaugh's body was found. The victim was quickly identified through fingerprints as 33-year-old Frederick Elmer Capen. Capen was a decorated Vietnam War hero working as a nurse at St. Joseph's Hospital in San Francisco. Capen was six feet tall and slim at 148 pounds. 
Capon's body was also fully clothed in a blue corduroy jacket, multicolored shirt, blue jeans, socks, shoes, and underwear. Autopsy showed that Capon died approximately 10 hours before the hiker found his body, making it likely that he was killed before midnight on May 11th. He had 16 stab wounds on his torso, several of which pierced his heart. Drag marks on the beach told investigators that Capon was moved approximately 20 feet from where he was killed. This time, the investigation was led by Detectives Rotea Guilford and his partner, Earl Sanders, who later became the first Black police chief of San Francisco Police Department. Guilford and Sanders were known for their unique ability to earn the trust of people who otherwise feared talking to police. After the Capon murder, the duo took over the investigation into all three murders. Guilford and Sanders reached out to the LGBTQ community in search of anyone who had information about suspicious men that frequented the bars. They heard many reports of a young black artist who sketched portraits of bar patrons as a means of seduction. They called him the doodler or the black doodler. The artist was extremely talented and skilled at disarming his subjects quickly and easily with flattery. Although no sketches were found at any of the crime scenes, Guilford and Sanders pursued the doodler lead, believing this person was an excellent suspect in the murders. They focused their efforts on finding surviving victims of attacks who could provide a description of the mysterious artist. Before they found any survivors, however, there was another murder on Ocean Beach. On June 4th, 1975, a hiker found the decomposed body of a man close to the 16th hole of Lincoln Park Golf Course near Land's End. This was approximately two miles from Ocean Beach. The man's throat was cut like Claus Christman, and the location was in the same vicinity as the prior murders. The victim was identified as 66-year-old Swedish immigrant and sailor Harold Goldberg. Goldberg is considered the fifth victim of the doodler, although there were a few differences from their previous four. First, the victim was discovered weeks after his death. Additionally, the man was considerably older than the previous victims. Whereas the others were fully dressed, Goldberg's pants were unzipped and his underwear were nowhere to be found. Outreach by Guilford and Sanders produced two witnesses who, survive, who survived encounters with a young black man carrying a knife. The identities of the two men have never been disclosed, although police know who they are. The first was a famous actor whose homosexuality was kept secret. He frequented gay bars catering to closeted celebrities and other public figures. Legend has it that the actor left one of the clubs with a young black male and returned to the actor's room to have sex. As they undressed, a knife fell from the black man's pocket, and the actor bolted from the room, escaping unharmed. Guilford and Sanders located the actor and brought him in for questioning. This actor was terrified that his name would get out and his sexual identity exposed. For this reason, no official report on the incident was ever entered into the case file. The second victim witness is known only as the diplomat. The diplomat reported meeting a young black man at the truck stop restaurant late one evening at around 2 a.m. The young man was drawing pictures of animals on a napkin. The artist was very talented and the diplomat struck up a conversation with him. Eventually, the two left together and headed back to the diplomat's apartment at Fox Plaza on Market Street, just south of the Tenderloin. When they arrived, the artist locked himself in the bathroom for some time. The diplomat sat down in a chair with his back to the bathroom door. The artist emerged from the bathroom with a steak knife and attacked the diplomat, stabbing him in the chest and back. The diplomat managed to grab the man and throw him into a wall, and the assailant fled the apartment and disappeared into the night. The diplomat walked from the apartment to a nearby hospital clinic. Examination revealed six stab wounds, one of which contained the broken knife blade and a pierced lung. The diplomat remained in the hospital for several weeks. He didn't immediately call the police, knowing if he did, he would be outed as gay. After a few weeks, the diplomat changed his mind and reported the incident. After interviewing the diplomat, police finally had a description of a potential suspect in the stabbing attacks. The, dipl the diplomat described an African-American man in his late teens, approximately six feet tall and slender. He had medium-toned skin, a long chin, and wore a navy watch cap. Based on these details, police generated a composite sketch of the artist. 
In addition to the physical description, the diplomat reported that during the attack, the artist said, you gay guys are all the same. As it turned out, the man with the knife made a similar statement to, to the actor during their encounter. Police released the sketch in November 1975 to the San Francisco Chronicle and the Sentinel. Guilford and Sanders put their faith into the sketch, hoping someone would come forward with the name of the artist. After the release of the sketch, several persons of interest were investigated by police. Detective Dan Cunningham told Kevin Fagan that there are 16 suspects in the original case file. Officer James Bowles wanted to be the one who caught the doodler. He patrolled the Castro district on foot looking for anyone who fit the description of the elusive young artist. One night, Bowles spotted an African-American male walking down the street. The man looked suspicious. He was wearing a long coat and his right arm did not bend as he walked. Bowles stopped the man and retrieved a sawed-off baseball bat from the sleeve of the man's coat. Searching further, Bowles found a kukri knife and a pawn slip. The pawn slip was for a watch that was stolen from victim Frederick Capon. The man seemed like a solid suspect. Police could not connect the watch to the murder, however, because it was stolen from Capon's apartment long before he was killed. Other suspects included a man who was arrested after bringing a sketchbook to a gay bar, and another who offered to draw sketches of bar patrons in the Tenderloin. The latter suspect also carried a butcher knife with him and a book of drawings. Both men were arrested, but neither could be tied to the murders. The killings appear to have ended in the late summer of 1975. In November, a very promising lead came in the form of a phone call. An anonymous caller gave police the name of an individual she believed was the man in the sketch and who she was convinced was the Ocean Beach killer. Ten days later, the woman called again, this time upset that police did nothing about the tip. In addition to the name, she gave police the license plate number of the man's car. Investigators looked into the individual named by the caller and placed him under surveillance. Approximately one week after the anonymous calls, police received a third call from a secretary who worked at a psychiatrist's office. She told them about a patient who fit the description of the suspect. A fourth call came in days later from the psychiatrist himself. He reported that over several months, one of his patients confessed to the Ocean Beach killings. He gave the patient's name, the same name given by the anonymous caller, and reported that the patient struggled with his sexual identity. He told police that he was absolutely certain that his patient was the doodler. In 1977, two years after the phone calls revealing the name of the patient, Detective Guilford spoke to the San Francisco Chronicle. In an article, Guilford claimed he was almost certain he knew the identity of the doodler and that his conclusion was based on the phone call from the psychiatrist. After the article, Guilford and Sanders brought the suspect in for questioning. Without an attorney present, the patient volunteered that he did see a psychiatrist for issues pertaining to his sexual identity and that he had experimented with homosexuality in his past. He denied his involvement in the murders, however. He claimed that the psychiatrist cured him and that he was now in a relationship with a woman. As sure as they were that they had their killer, the detectives did not have any concrete evidence against him in any of the killings. With nothing new to go on, Guilford and Sanders had to move on to other cases and the investigation of the Ocean Beach murders was de pardon me, deprioritized, fading into relative obscurity. After the interview, the patient left the Bay Area and traveled around the United States. At a press conference in 2019, Detective Cunningham announced that the Doodler case was being reactivated with a new sense of urgency. This time, investigators wished to give the cases the attention they were due almost 50 years before. Cunningham made a public plea for help in finding the doodler and stated that DNA samples have been submitted for testing. The original composite sketch was released again with an aged version for comparison. Cunningham told Kevin Fagan that the patient remains their number one person of interest in the doodler murders. Cunningham interviewed the patient in 2018, finding him unemotional and calm in his responses. He denied responsibility for the Ocean Beach killings and voluntarily gave a sample of his DNA. Though he had previously had a relationship with a woman, 
He currently lives as a homosexual. The patient's DNA was already encoded from prior arrest. The sample was sent to those collected from various crime scenes for comparison. We don't know if any results came back from that testing. Thinking that the killer may have been the anonymous caller in the Kavanaugh case, they compared the patient's voice to the voice in the original call. The results were inconclusive, but analysts reported that they couldn't exclude the patient as the caller. Cunningham tracked the patient's whereabouts after he left the Bay Area and used the violent criminal apprehension program known as VICAP to research for similar incidents in those locations. The results produced 15 hits, including a series of cases in Louisiana. According to Cunningham, the patient currently lives in the East Bay of San Francisco. In January of 2022, SFPD announced a sixth potential doodler victim. In April of 1975, two months prior to the discovery of Harold Goldberg, a hiker found 52-year-old attorney Warren Andrews in a pool of blood in Land's End. He was lying underneath some hanging brush near a cliff moaning. The location was on a service road near Land's End Trail and the Lincoln Park Golf Course, not far from the Goldberg crime scene. Andrews was rushed to the hospital and remained in a coma for two months before he died. Unlike the other victims, Warren Andrews was not stabbed but beaten with a rock and branch. Despite the different MO, investigators believe Andrew was killed by the same person who killed the five other men in cruising spots at, at or near Ocean Beach. Their theory is that the killer lost his knife over the cliff during a struggle and then resorted to bludgeoning to finish the job. Andrews was a former merchant marine and a World War II veteran. At the time of his death, he was working as an attorney in Tacoma, Washington. Members of his family believed that Andrews was secretly gay, like four of the five other doodler victims. DNA found in the Andrews case was also sent for testing, and again, we do not know of any results. Killer young artists luring men to their deaths with portraits, flattery, and the promise of sex? Or was the doodler nothing more than an urban legend, born of rumors, passed through dark recesses of smoke-filled bars? Police believe the doodler is responsible for the murders. They leave open the possibility that the victims met their killer during, at, or near where they died. Currently, a $200,000 reward is being offered for information leading to the arrest of the so-called doodler. Many tips are coming in, thanks to ri revived interest generated by Kevin Fagan's podcast and the reopening of the investigation. More is needed before police can close this case. However, if you or anyone you know has information about the case, the suspect or the victims, please reach out to one of the following sources. You can call the San Francisco Police's 24-hour hotline at 415-575-4444 or text TIP411, starting your message with SFPD. And you can also reach out to Kevin Fagan at 415-570-9299 or on his website, doodlerpod.com. So now let's go to Lee to get his take on the doodler. Is the doodler a myth? Well, perhaps aspects of it, because before I, I go into the profile part, I just want to point out that this idea that uh, a, a black man is attacking people, uh, this, this doodler is doing it. That's only one surviving victim. We don't have any definite links to any of the murder victims between this this black killer that's all complete speculation so though i like it and i like him as a suspect and i think that's a great lead uh, i want to caution there too before we get too excited i'm going to be for the sake of time proceeding as if that's likely true it seems like a good lead so what motivates the doodler well we've seen this kind of thing before that's uh, what you would call an ego dystonic uh, homosexual maybe sex sadist too um, ego dystonic, meaning uh, he's a gay guy and he's not cool with it. And the way that he copes with that may involve all sorts of subconscious self-deceptions. Uh, I'll give you some examples of other cases. We have Colin Ireland, who is a much more organized, much more complex offender. He was in the UK in 1993. Colin Ireland would go to the Colhern Pub, famous gay leather bar in London. He would pick up men. He would go back to the apartments with them under the pretenses of, of having consensual 
uh, BDSM sex with them. They would get tied up and then he would torture them and eventually strangle them. Now, never, um, to, as far as we know, and there doesn't seem to be evidence of any conventional sexual assault, no penetration, no fondling, no ejaculation, anything like that. And Colin Ireland always said, no, I'm, I'm not gay. I, uh, I don't like them. That's why I killed them. But then it's like, well, why did you focus so much of the violence on their genitals, Colin? Why did you get them naked and whip them? So, you, you, so I'm starting off with this because I think it's important that you realize that um, a lot of them bury their motives. They may not even be conscious to themselves. So another case out of Canada immediately struck me, uh, the case of Ron Sears, the slasher. Uh, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, from 1945 to 46, Ron Sears was a teenager, by the way, 17 years old, and he would go to uh, spots where gay men would hook up. Of course, it was much more repressed then, even less open than, than San Francisco in the, in the 70s at that time. We're talking about uh, guys just hanging around parks um, and, and all kinds of secret signals. There's no gay bars or anything like that. And they didn't even know that the victims were gay at first, but what Sears would do is he'd go up, he, he knew something about the interaction rituals uh, between them. And he would start to go to a place with one of these gay men. And then he would uh, stab them multiple times. He killed two. He wounded, I think it was maybe three others. And at one point he even sent a letter saying, my avenge on these people is great. Something like that. And um, they've ruined my life, the slasher. So uh, when it comes down to it, Sears is arrested. And what does he say? He says, I was molested when I was nine. And they've ruined my life as a result. But if you look at the wounds and, and the patterns of the wounds and, and, and the situations he got them into, you know, with their pants down, about ready to engage in sex, you realize, no, I mean, he could have just gone up to these people and stabbed them at any point. Um, he got as close as he could to a sexual encounter, and then he substituted violence for it. And I think this is what the doodler's doing, too. He's like Ireland. He's like Sears, more like Sears, um, in that he's a disorganized offender. And I think for this reason, he's younger. I like the age range of 17 to 24. Let's let's go with that. This is not a complicated offender. I don't think he's very resourceful, doesn't have much money. And uh, uh, However, I think he has similarities to Sears. He would have had a knife collection. I think he would have had surrogates, whether that's killing animals or carving up pillows or uh, throwing knives or whatever it is. This is a guy that likes to play with knives. So that would be something you'd look out for. Would have toyed with the idea of writing letters, too, I think. Probably been into um, horror films or, or thrillers. Uh, that's something you would see in his background. Is he a psychopath? Well, we see there's some traits. He seems to be glib and superficially charming. Um, certainly doesn't seem to show any remorse. Or, you know, he keeps doing it. Um, this whole thing has, has a sexually promiscuous element to it. There's a sensation-seeking element to it. But none of these quite get us to the point where we can confidently say he's a psychopath. So he's psychopathic. He's heading in that direction. But, um, but we can't confidently say that. I think he's uh, also one of the rare examples, too, of a serial killer who's fairly artistic and imaginative. We know that because of our, his artistic talents, but is able to move through the gay community and, and use charm and endear himself to these people. I think that's something that we could probably see in his background, um, which is important, too. I, it's, it's tempting to say, well, this is a guy who only goes into the gay world to kill. But that's not really possible because you have to learn the, the patois of the gay world. You have to learn the interaction rituals. So he's going to he's gonna be there, even if it's just to get good at killing, but I doubt it. I think this is something that, you know, he's gone in there, he's, he's seen it as being curious, and he's dabbled um, quite a bit with that. And I think that um, he knows he's going to kill. He knows he's going to kill. He, he plans it. That's pretty clear. Uh, but it has a courtship element. I think there's a part of him saying, um, could I pick this guy up? Could I charm this man? Could I get to the point where I, I could have sex with this guy, but I'm not a queer? And, and this is where his mind starts to play tricks, right? He's, you gay guys, not me, because I'm not gay. I just go to gay bars, pick up gay guys, get into situations where I almost fuck them. But, but no, you're gay, and, and you're all like this. And so it's when it gets to the point of contact that he, that he does that, and he substitutes um, violence... Uh, for sex it's his way of saying i'm not fucking gay though right and and hurting them and you can see rage in it i mean there's 17 stab wounds first victim uh another one here has got 15 16 so he's angry 
but is it just anger? Um, I don't think so. I think there's there, there's a, a sense of uh, this is like an alternate way of rooting his sexuality around here. Does it arrive? Maybe it's sexually sadistic. I don't know. Uh, that's about as, as much details as we have. So beyond that, what else do I have to say, really? Um, this guy, menial employment, he's not going to be anything fancy. He's not going to hold down a good job. He may be unemployed in um, future relationships going forward. I, I doubt he's in a gay relationship, but he might be going on in the future. And he's, he's always going to be either menially employed or, or unemployed. And he may be... Um, he may be like the the more passive partner in the relationship as far as um, he doesn't do the work. He doesn't bring home the bread. He, he's more of the dependent partner. And that's because he's a criminal personality, like I said, possibly psychopathic. So before I ramble on anymore, um, that's that's a pretty good profile. I, I, I like the suspect. Um, one extra thing that occurred to me, all the victims are white. Seems like the suspect is black. And so... If you think about it, if he was just killing gay people because he hated gay people, it'd probably be easier for this person to actually kill black men. So what does this tell us? It tells us that these are the men that are his sexual preference. So if we're looking for um, people that may have been uh, boyfriends, I think maybe later on in life, they're going to fit the profile of uh, older white men, um, fair haired. And with that, I'm going to call back um, Alex and Morph to discuss I could just go on, keep going on, but I'm I'm very conscious conscious not to do that. <laughs> well, one thing one thing that jumped out to me was that uh, was, that I found interesting was he's you know a lot of times killers have a very specific. Uh, assuming these were all done by one person, they have a very specific target. They look at certain places. Uh, they try and get into certain circumstances. If all these cases are done by one person, you've got people inside. Uh, you know, apartments, hotels, whatever, then you've got people out on the beach. So this guy is sort of all over the place. And does that mean he's just getting these people, these victims where he can, where he finds them, or he gets an opportunity um, as opposed to, you know, bringing them all to the beach and, and killing them there. He's, he's doing it in the apartments that they're in or hotels, whatever the case may be. So he, he seems like he's sort of open to, um, wherever he can get a victim that's where he's going to try and do this well you'll notice that the, the two victims that were attacked uh i believe it was both those were the indoor cases am i right alex i recall yes that okay so that's interesting because does he fail when he's indoors and why <laughs> i'm not sure why or maybe it's not him right what i would think mm -hmm. is that uh the person who's doing this is probably got a stroll of gay bars that he's familiar with and he's either meeting these guys at those bars or in between those bars. Um, so when the, the street's connecting them and then they go off to different places and that's probably uh, more situational. He doesn't know where they're going. Maybe he tries to lead them to certain places or maybe he's, he says, you know, you choose um, where to go with this. So be, if you're doing like a more detailed victimology and you could do this now because, you know, obviously there's more acceptance of um, – of homosexuality you could probably talk to um other people and say D does he have a favorite spot that he likes to go to to do this which you couldn't mm -hmm. really do back then and then you would find out i think that maybe the victims led him to separate um to different places something that i noticed was that with the exception of jay stevens who was out very you know public in his being gay he was an entertainer mm. All the other victims were in the closet. They were also a couple of four originals. So what you have, what I notice is that you have some older men and men who are not as able, as adept mm -hmm. at navigating the gay community bar scenes. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be more gullible and more vulnerable. The you know, an attractive young man who's flattering, showing them attention. And so I wonder if this is part of his, how he chooses victims is being in the bar and spotting the guy that is the least savvy. 
Yeah, there's there's the savvy element too, and I th I think that's really important. But what I also got off what you're saying there is if they're not if if they're the least out, if they're the le you know if they're most closeted, then uh, linking them, like identifying them, and trying to trace their habits and such is a lot more difficult as well. Um, we saw this in the, the mm -hmm. Bruce MacArthur yes. case in Toronto. He picked on a lot of um, Muslim and, and South Asian victims uh, who who weren't out. And their families had no mm -hmm. idea that they um, were yeah. gay or bisexual, right? So it, you've got the double thing. They're they're more naive about the uh, the lifestyle, but then it's also it's harder for to investigate because nobody knows they're gay. Right. That's an excellent point. Yeah. It's a, and one frustrating thing about this case is it it seems to me on one hand that a uh, a young black male frequenting these places hanging around sketching would get a reputation as, Hey, that's sketch guy or whatever nickname they want to give him. And someone somewhere would know this guy. You would think then again, San Francisco is such a big city and the gay community there was so, there were so many people gathered there because it was sort of a, a place where they felt comfortable that it's easy to see him getting lost and in, in mixed in and then nobody really, you know, coming forward to say, Hey, I know this guy, but it just seems like, you know, on one hand that you would just say, Hey, I know that guy. He's the, he's sketch guy. He comes in here every Friday night and someone would eventually they did do that. come forward. That's what Rotang and Guilford eventually unearthed was this rumor spreading through the bars that there was this attractive young man that sketch guys to be able to lure them out. And, I think the amount of anonymity that they have permeated the gay bar scenes, um, maybe nobody could come up with a name, but they knew who he was and they gave him the name, the doodler. Or where I wanted to go with this too, is maybe he's not in San Francisco as much as you'd think. Okay. Um, <laughs> not an expert on this, but as far as I know, the, where the you know, black, demographic is most concentrated is around Oakland, right? So maybe this is a guy that lives in Oakland or, or somewhere like that. And he spends most of his time there and then occasionally goes into San Francisco to do this. Um, so what this brings me to interesting next is can you imagine if you find some um, black males in Oakland or somewhere like that stabbed, you're not going to go to, this is a gay guy that was stabbed. You're going to, you know, it's, it's a gang thing. Right. Um, but um and I hope I don't overstep my bounds saying this. I don't think many would disagree. Um, back then, particularly, uh, black males, arguably even less accepting of, of homosexuality than, than white men. It's uh, really stigmatized in the black community. And so it's even pro b further below the surface, especially with a, you know, a certain type of macho black men. So where am I going with this? I'm saying there could be more victims in Oakland or other areas like that. And they've just been mm -hmm. written off as guys stabbed in the park in a gang activity. So oh, if anyone's listening from there, take another look. There could be other survivors too that got away that just never went to the oh, police yeah. because they said, Hey, I don't want to get outed and I'm not going coming, you know, going to the police and telling them this because I'm afraid my family will find out or my coworkers will find out. Or they'd yeah. be arrested themselves, which was often the case. If they reported one of the gay bashings, um, oh, you're gay. Okay, you're getting arrested. Okay, so should we move on and then um, bring, bring up Cloyd later to talk about this? Yep. Okay. So what do we have next, guys? Next is Cloyd joining us. Oh, okay. We don't have a guest. This week. No, we do not have a guest this week. Okay. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, yeah, I have you know I have a couple of thoughts about this. I agree with Morph that there are probably more survivors that just didn't report it because of the of the the atmosphere at the time. Uh, it's also curious to me that the one victim they said there were two different knives being used, which is really odd. A person generally doesn't carry two different knives and do the stabbing mm -hmm. with different knives. So is there another person involved? I don't know. Awesome. And then. Yeah, and then this whole thing about this famous actor that didn't want to be outed, so he didn't put anything in the report. You just put so-and-so victim, and you use 
BS initials said this happened and you put the whole thing down there and you don't identify them. There's no problem with that. That happens all the time. You have people that don't want to, you have an informant, a, a confidential informant that wants to mm -hmm. tell you about something. And you just put an informant here, here and after referred to as BN or whatever, and you don't use the real initials, said this and you go through everything. You, know, you don't just not document it because that's a big, makes you wonder if that really ever happened. If the police didn't document it at all, that's really odd. You know, right. it's really odd. And the other thing I want to know is, okay, so you had DNA in a couple of scenes. Did the DNA, even if you couldn't identify a suspect, did they match each other? Was it the same people, the same person's DNA on both victims or not? That's real easy. You don't have to know who the suspect is or be able to identify a suspect with it. Mm -hmm. Say Yes, this is the same person or no, this is not the same person. Real easy. That's very basic. So that makes you wonder about that too. Of course, today, given all our abilities with... Uh, forensics and DNA and everything, if you if they maintain the evidence and kept it, you should be able to easily get DNA off stuff and then go back and either test it one-on-one -on -one against this guy who the, the psychiatric patient, who I like a lot as a suspect, by the way. Yeah. I like him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, test him directly. It's either him or it's not. And if it's not him, then you go into CODIS and all these other things, or else you, then you go to genealogy, right? And you and you just look for an unknown suspect who's never been in CODIS. And you know this these cases, if they happen today, would be hugely solvable, right? Mm. Right. And in the seventies, they weren't. Not a sophisticated perpetrator at all. Handed to them on a platter, this guy who was a psychiatric patient, and boy, he sure sounds good to me. I mean, I, you know, and there, yeah, Alex. more. Um, that we don't know and we won't know because Dan Cunningham, the detective working the case, is keeping all of the fact tight of under under seal. Um, so he didn't. I mean, Kevin right. did what he could to gather what facts he could, but right. even in talking with Cunningham, he's not giving up any of the details. So, like for instance, phone call from the psychiatrist. You know that he gave him gave them a lot more info oh, sure, about yeah, what yeah. was said other than that I'm completely convinced. Yeah. You know? And, you know, other than that, first of all, detectives in San Francisco are called inspectors, not detectives. I apologize. <laughs> but, but, uh, and I've met a lot of inspectors from San Francisco. <laughs> but, but uh, again, that's fine. He shouldn't. But this case, if everything worked out, it, it should be solved by now. Something did. Yep, they're waiting for those results to come back. Yeah, but it doesn't. Take, think, how long? Uh, how long ago did they put this stuff in? It doesn't take that long. I believe it was around 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they should have known by now. A year. Yeah, a year. Tops. And, and and this guy willingly gave his DNA. Yeah, um, yes. maybe it's so not him. If they, if you, you, maybe it's not him. You know, yeah, sometimes we see good suspects on paper, and it just turns out not time. to be the. Have to be the right person. Well, well, let's dial it back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, none of these murder victims have been conclusively linked to this um, this black Correct. group. Right. We have yeah. guys that were attacked. We have one guy that was attacked that was linked to this black yeah, dude. Maybe it was the same black dude layer, but all the others could have been attacked by entirely different people. It could have been, but right. if, if in almost every serial case, serial killer case, you have people that got away, right? And they're the, they're very valuable as information and suspect uh, and witnesses and stuff because it's not it's not science and it's you know and you know speaking of not science the the uh, voice comparison <laughs> with the caller and the, you know yeah. that's junk science i'm sorry you'll never get better than an inclusive on that i mean it's just i mean it's not established well enough not that i completely did, i think they should have done it but don't put all your your uh, your peanuts in that basket because it's not going to get you anywhere. I kind of felt the same about them putting all of their peanuts in the same basket of this rumor of the doodler. Well, right. You, know, you never know. Yeah, right. Is that true or not? And uh, you know, yeah. It sure sounds good. I like it. I like it as a lead. They had to tell they must have got it from more than one person, right? They must have talked to several Definitely. People. Yeah, from several bars. Right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean this guy is the killer. It just means he's the guy that picks up other men that way. Right, <laughs> and they had multiple, unless they're all the same person. Right, they detained two other men, yeah. who black 
young black men who brought sketchbooks into bars right that so unless it's the same guy as the patient right you have well, all these arms you know, people here, right yeah, exactly right yeah and, and, you and there's a good it. reason yeah. for that because we've established that this True. is a subculture that these people are attacked so they, they could be attackers or people that fear that they might be getting attacked who want to defend right. themselves all kinds of people walking around with knives i mean it's it i remember hearing this you know from many cases i looked at rolling a gay guy right right well it's 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 you know the thing is that's a it, that's a that lifestyle, whether it's a, a gay man picking up another gay man or a straight person picking up on a straight person in a bar is very hazardous, right? Yes. It's a high, yeah, it's it's completely you're rolling the dice because the guy that's picking you up could be a guy that's gonna kill you. You don't know who they are, right? Yep. <laughs> and you're just meeting strangers for sex. That's a very high risk thing. And does that mean I mean is it possible that all these people are not killed by the same guy? Absolutely. That's why you have to, when you have these cases, you have to investigate everyone independently. And if they're the same guy, they'll they'll naturally come together. But don't assume they're the same guy. Mm -hmm. You know, although you got the geographic things and the, you know, and the, here's another thing I thought when I was listening to you guys talk about the case. The guy bashed you in the head, he's the same guy. Well, he very well could be because MOs are very fluid. But they, they speculated his knife fell over the cliff. Did they find his knife at the bottom of the cliff? Probably not. So where does that come from? That's wild speculation, right? Does that mean it's not the same guy? Absolutely not. They, they change their ammo all the time, depending on the situation. Maybe they didn't bring their knife with them. Maybe they forgot in the car. Maybe Any they weren't planning on killing someone that day and they saw Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but to say he must have dropped his knife over the cliff. Well, then you must have found his knife at the bottom of the cliff to say that. That's the only way you can know that. You know, right. so, like, these are things you got to so watch out for if you're investigating these cases. We have a comment from Renee Brown. And she had a thought. White men have been more comfortable exploring their sexuality without thoughts of being at risk of harm, even in secret groups. So maybe those victims were more accessible and would all the racial inequality that also impacts the gay world. Absolutely thought true. Absolutely true. Yeah, very good point. It, it, if there's that many more uh, openly white gay men to target. It, it's you know you say the openly ratio. White. not even openly. I mean even openly even, white even <laughs> overtly gay white men. Yeah. Yeah, just more of a, a victim possible victim pool there. Well and there is and there are it is and not to, not that there aren't a lot of gay black men, but there are many more gay white men. So that's your that's your pool, right? Exactly. It's just and this person probably doesn't care that they're black or white. It's just easier to pick these people up. Right. So it's like everything else. It's just like serial killers to pick up prostitutes because prostitutes will go with anybody. Right. Because <laughs> they don't care. And that's why they get murdered more often in these cases. It's the same thing with these these cases. Um, Kathy or not uh, is one of our regular participants. Uh, she says, is he upset that he is gay and he hurts them because of that? What do you think, Lee? Well, I think I might have said that in a, a more yeah. technical way, ego dysonic <laughs> homosexuality. So uh, upset that he's gay. I'm going to phrase it like that. Um, he's conflicted, high, highly conflicted about it. He has the urge uh, and he suppresses it because he didn't want to acknowledge that part about himself. But he goes through all the steps of the courtship right until the part where, the, where they would have a sexual encounter. And then he flips it to violence and he makes, no, you're gay. You know, oh, can you believe it? He would have had sex with me, right? Yeah. It's, it's something like that. And then he gets angry. That anger is probably just as much at himself. There's this interesting thing um, from psychoanalysis uh, that I, I happen to believe in called projection, which you see happen in a lot of serial killer. Um, so he's he's like getting angry at this guy who, for, for being gay, but he's really angry at himself for being gay. And that guy is like a mirror of his own. Um, and I use this word in, in inverted commas, a perversion, right? Right. So, um, so yeah, um, complicated psychological stuff. But you see this in, in gay offenders all the time, to, you know, to be honest with you, um, it, gay, gay serial offenders. Yeah. It, would this guy be someone that was destined to be a killer, in your opinion? Uh, because uh, not just because of the sexual thing, but because he was programmed to, to violence. What's your I thought on know. that? I don't know. I think he was going to always be a violent person. 
But uh, in this particular case, if you had changed um, the way that homosexuality um, was perceived by society in this particular case, he wouldn't have that same conflict. Mm. So, he, you know, might he roll people for money? Might he be domestically abusive? Might he you know, he'd be, still be a bad dude? Um, but I don't think he would have quite the same um, tension inside him that would result in this because he could have his gay sex and it, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, that's not true of all of them. It's it's not like I'm usually not a fan of if we just change society, man, I'm not. A, but in this case, I think, yeah, I think that really contributes to the way that his violence was directed. But and, and here's here's one thing that interesting uh, thing in my mind that. You know, let's say we have someone that's unsure of their sexuality, they're bisexual, whatever the case may be, they want to try and experience. Then they get into the situation, they say, nope, this isn't for me, I'm, I'm not doing it. Most people, I, I imagine, in that scenario would just pump the brakes and say, okay, this, I'm not comfortable with this. This guy, instead of doing that, stabs people repeatedly. Yeah, but um, he, so there's something there. In that situation over and over and over, right? Um, he knows that he's not going to be okay with it. He's telling himself a very elaborate lie. He, I imagine it's something like, I'm going to go out there and, and find one of these gays, and I'm just going to see. I'm just going to see if I can pick him up, and I'm just going to see if he would go there and, and, and have sex with me. But then at, at that point, it's, but I'm not, I'm not gay, though, and I hate him. And, and, and so he's, he's aware, he's vaguely aware of what he's doing. Um, psychologically very complicated it's, it's not like he's keep, keeps accidentally finding himself in gay encounters do you get what i'm saying patricia burns um said two knives are carried it's generally by someone very young yeah she's british too so she would know we have uh we have knife issues here oh, okay yeah. okay <laughs> Patricia, yeah, it's because of the victim demographic, Patricia says, that his wasn't, aided. oh, is it because of the victim demographic that his wasn't, that this wasn't investigated? Yes. That this wasn't investigated thoroughly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although it, when you start to get multiple victims, you know, <laughs> yeah, in San Francisco, it's not that unusual, so you probably got to. It, it demographics shouldn't matter. Of course, I'm talking in right thousands, not the 1970s. But uh, was was right. it really not investigated thoroughly? Yeah, it, maybe it probably. I, I would doubt that it was not investigated thoroughly. But they had restrictions on the amount of, of what they could do at that time, right? They had to find a person, and then they had to find you know, and forensic evidence wasn't as available then as it is today. So if they right. still have the, if that's why I say if they still have the evidence, they can have it all retested and maybe come up with answers. And they may find out that they're not all the same person. Maybe they're all mm -hmm. different, two or three different people, but, but you never know. Another big reason why this particular case or series um, was not investigated as thoroughly as it could have been was because right about the time you had the zebra killings going on. Mm -hmm. And the zebras were... Uh, I mean, how many? I can't remember exactly how many victims. Over twenty. Uh, A lot, yeah. Um, they were literally terrorizing San Francisco. Right. San Francisco also, still receiving communications from the Zodiac. You had the Symbionese Liberation Army kidnapping at Patty Hearst. They had a yep. lot of huge cases that were had a much greater effect on the area and the nation right. than a series of five murdered men and you know san francisco the is the police department is not large compared to new york la chicago and so they had limited resources too because i mean it's it's the, the city is 49 square miles right it's yep. a small right geographical city but it's condensed in there with all these people and so there uh, the police department was probably 1800 people which means their homicide unit was probably 30 detectives with mm -hmm. with all these things going on, Zodiac, Zebra, SLA, it's it's they were overwhelmed. Yeah. So, what do you think as an investigation strategy, Cloyd? Um, any case where there's a someone picking up victims at bars, I always like. Well, send someone undercover into the bars. Right. That's exactly. Well, you know, the, it sounds like the one detective. He didn't go undercover, but he was on his feet in those areas at night trying to find. He did. It sounds like he did good work. 
trying to do this. But like I said, they, they were compared to what we could do today. They were hamstrung. You know, they did, there's only so much you can do. And, and again, you got all these other cases going on, big time cases that require a lot of manpower. And so you're trying to do all of them, but you just can't. And so, you know, I think they, you're right. That's exactly what they probably should have done. If they, if this was the only serial murder case they're handling during that time or major case, they probably would have been able to do that. But they were, again, overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with, that was a wild time in the seventies, right? I came on the police department yeah. right in the seventies, right? And, but, and I wasn't a detective until the 90s, until 1990, but oh my gosh, it's a lot of work. Uh, there's a movie, a good movie called Cruising, Cruising with Al yeah. Pacino, um, yeah. that's reminiscent of what we're talking about right now. Yeah, that, uh, we'll get to that later um, because that's linked to a series of murders in, in New yes. York that was inspired by it. And, and now, you know, I want to talk about yeah. yeah, but we'll get to that in the scrum. Yes, um, join the DDA. Watch the scrum later. We'll, we'll talk about um, the Cuppy murders. Getting back to it, though, you, that's also difficult in itself, though, right? Going undercover at a gay bar because it's not like the guy, he pulls out the knife and starts stabbing you in the bar. It's like, hey, do you want to come with me? Okay, so then you just follow every guy that wants to go into a park or a bathroom with you. The problem is, and like, oh, shit, you're many people do, right? Many you. people do that aren't going to, don't have a plan to kill you. That's yeah. the problem with this whole idea. And yeah, how many gay bars were there, there in San back. Francisco? Oh, at the time? Okay, thanks. I'll see you later. There, a lot. There had okay. to be a lot of gay bars in San Francisco at that time. So how do you? Sure, sure there were. Your cover which would be going to go to quickly, very well, quickly. You know, it, And there's yeah. a lot of gay bars in Seattle right now, and it's you know that stuff happens every night, but they're not serial killers, right? So it's yeah. hard. What uh, violence? So, interpersonal violence? There can be, but not every time. Probably ten percent of the time, ninety percent that you're not worried. That is happening, right? So, question. In around this time, how sophisticated was the study of victimology? Well, I, they'd be doing it in some university somewhere, but I, yeah. So, to, to the degree to which formal victimology is used in, by police is, I don't know, Chloe, not really. I, it, you don't really need it. You just need to consider the victims, right? Yeah, you're, you're not you pulling out your textbook. Them, right? You don't have to go okay. on deep into it, right? Exactly. But in terms of trying to target, you know, going in and to the bars and trying to find the guy and, and sending in decoys, you're going to talk more about these victims in order to get the type of person that this guy's going. Although I think the type of person that is a potential victim is a gay guy that will go with this guy. And that's pretty broad, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't think, I think like it's like Lee said, he was projecting and he had issues himself. And so, he didn't, I don't know that he, unless you can find something that these people all had in common, besides being white males, that, uh, that. Not yeah, young. Whoever, no, not young. Yeah. It's just whoever will go with him. I, I don't think it's any more complex than that. I mean, if, if it's, if somebody wanted to go with him and it wasn't his type, he wouldn't go with him. But I think, I think it's anybody that would go with him. That was his type. Uh, that I'm not so sure about it. I think he does yeah. have a, a, a type, um, you know, men 30s to 30s 40s well those are the people he had, he approaches right and starts talking to right he does that there but yeah because that's all the victims fit that category but yeah i guess we'd have to have a, a larger demographic more um, yeah and then see is is this the typical demographic or or is this just a small part of it so right. just, exactly. just back a bit on that but how do we like the linkage by the way because um <sighs> I can see how we could say they're they're done by different people, but we've got um, white men, uh, 30s into middle age, multiple stab wounds outside. Um, I think, and, it's pretty, and then geographic locations pretty close. So pretty, all pretty close, yeah, yeah, pretty close. And you know, as far as the inside outside, with the two that got away, it's just who wherever the potential victim wants to go, right? I mean, that's the thing. If a person's got a hotel room, they're going to go to a hotel room. If they don't, they're going to go someplace else. And so, especially if they're closeted, you know, if they're local and closeted, they can't go home. But if they're, if they're visiting from out of town, they can go to a hotel room. And, you know, I, I like, I mean, I'm, I would say I'm 80% sure these guys are all the victims of the same guy, but mm -hmm. you can never be 100% sure, right? You don't know for sure. Well, because you've got, there's a lot of them. How many other got... cases like this do you have going on? Normally, yeah, got I mean, overkill. this happened. 
you've got overkill, right? You've got 17 stab wounds, first yeah, victim. In my experience, um, that's not unusual either. I mean, oh, yeah, for sure. And I yeah. can understand that because I wouldn't stab someone like three times ago. Well, that should do the trick. You're like, no, oh, they, you know, and the <laughs> thing about it, it, yeah. it, you know, I've been to a couple of these homicides like this where like the person's head is beaten in until it's like an inch thick at the end, right? It's just rage and overkill. Mm. Why? I don't know, but that just seems to be pretty typical. And uh, and the thirty stab wounds and stuff in a case like this, I wouldn't say is atypical. I think it's pretty typical in a case like this. We also attacking a full grown man. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. you are. Although it's overkill. I mean, after the first five or six, the guy's dead. But where is that line? Okay, so so where is our line where where it isn't overkill and it isn't underkill? Well, you never know. I mean, it's out. Well, that's well, right. Yeah. The just enough spot. The sweet spot. The yeah. sweet spot, but if you're talking thirty or forty stab wounds, yeah, that's that's a frenzy. You know, if you're talking five or six, not necessarily, right? That's a thing. Along, and, along these lines, I'm I'm curious what you think, Lee. Um, if if we didn't have the the aspect or the the nugget that hey, this African American guy is in the bar sketching, um, if we didn't know that, if we didn't know that one guy survived and attacked by a black male. Would you tend to think this was a white male doing this? Because I remember, like, with the yeah. DC sniper case for sure, they're like, you're looking for a white guy in his right. 20s. Um, that's who's doing this. And it turned out to be the complete opposite. So I'm <laughs> curious what the police in their minds were looking for at the time. Um, I'd imagine they probably thought he was white. Probably. Yeah. Although, you know, this kind of goes back to the FBI profiles and don't get me started on that. But I mean, you know, <laughs> but, you know, like like in the Atlanta child murders, everybody mm -hmm. assumed it was a white guy. Right? right. Except for this is a guy that's walking in the deep black community and not being noticed. That should have told yeah. everybody it's a black guy you know, because a white guy would be noticed in those communities. So those are things you got to take into account. But you, you're right. I mean, the, the, the textbook thing says, yeah, it's another white guy, but that's why you can never, you can take that and keep it, keep it as something to consider in the back of your mind, but never commit to it completely. Yeah, if it was like a, if it was like a middle class singles bar in New York, something like that, then I would, I would, I would say no, I'm pretty damn sure he's white. But this scene, there's, you know, people I don't think get to be quite as exclusive and picky. And and for that reason, I, I think there's there's probably um, there's, there's probably I don't like I'm trying to think of a better word than race mixing. I don't like the way that sounds. But San Francisco is a, a yeah. great melting pot of yeah. all kinds of yeah. races and and yeah. everyone. And so you know there could have been any number of different kinds of victims or different um, potential suspects of any race uh, in this case. Although mm -hmm. there's it falls back to the the. Uh, incorrect assumption that everybody has that almost all serial killers are white and that's not true you know it's not yeah no. no, it's not a it doesn't have anything to do with race it has to do with their psychological makeup and everything like that rebecca casello how often do serial killers actually cross racial or ethnic lines it's a good question quite frequently yeah um, much more than people think much more than people say yeah, there was another question just before this one was was there semen found? I would guess not because I don't think the sexual uh, the sexual act was completed in these cases. We don't we no. don't know. I mean, Cunning, like I said, Cunningham is not revealing right, the details not about this. There could have been, there may not have been. I wouldn't know. Again, if there was, they'd have this guy in custody already <laughs> because that's the easiest. Yeah, you know? No kidding. Yeah, yeah that's so. the easiest. Like I gave examples of, of crimes that are like this, where there was no semen that have been solved, right? Right. Um, so, okay. yeah, don't think so. Um, getting back to how often do they, they cross, um, it really is racial lines more than ethnic lines, right? Because we all cross ethnic lines. All, all, ethnic, ethnicity isn't really a thing anymore, but race is, is a bigger... Um, yeah, serial killers, particularly, um, particularly ones that live sort of... Um, that target victims in a sexually promiscuous sphere, like people that target prostitutes. And uh, I think to a lesser extent, uh, gay commu community and, and pickups, but the, the more that it's, that's a sex thing. I think that, you know, when you're picking people up, particularly with prostitutes, there's a lot of crossing of racial lines. Um, different when you see a killer like Bundy, right. Who's killing um, a co-ed that represents a certain type right. of ideal that he holds. 
Right. Then you have Ramirez who crossed, you know, both Hispanic, white. It was really more about the neighborhoods and the perception of as wealth than it was. Well, right. he has an inordinate amount of Asian victims. And this never occurred to me, but uh, Chris Duet pointed out um, there's um, Ramirez had the, um, what was it, the uncle or the cousin that went to Vietnam oh, yeah. and came back and showed him those pictures yeah. of the Asians all mutilated. Women, I don't yes. Know. Anyway, back oh, to yeah. You. Yeah. So, what do, now let's bring Ashley up and have her tell us what's going on with our Patreon. This you want to come out? Come on up. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank our newest member, Kimberly S. And if you'd like to join her and um, get these nice benefits, we have the first one, which is the Nancy Drew tier that gives you the ad free episodes, the bonus content and the scrum. The scrum is the after hours with our hosts and guests where the conversation continues. The Colombo tier contains the perks of the first plus a guarantee that at least one of your comments or voicemails will be heard on the show. The Poirot tier contains the perks of the first and second plus access to a quarterly private session where members will join and interact with one or more hosts to discuss cases not explored on the show. Think of it as a masterclass where you and the host dig even deeper into your pet case. The fourth and final is Sherlock Holmes, which contains all perks so far, plus a VIP pass to any special in-person event where you can meet and hang with the hosts of Citizen Detective. As we grow, there will be a lot more coming your way. Watch this space. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash Citizen Detective. Citizen Detective streams every two weeks on YouTube at Citizen Depod on Twitter at Citizen Detective Podcast on Facebook and twitch.tv slash Citizen Detective. Now back to the show. We definitely have some great Patreon supporters. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I feel the interaction is getting a little bit more fluid now, too. We got the recordings and it's getting there. Went a little yeah, slower than I think, but we're, I think we're starting to get our rhythm now. And we're getting people that are listening to old episodes, you know, shooting questions to us, leaving voicemails saying, hey, I listened to that episode from a while back and, you know, this came to my mind. So keep keep uh, letting us know what you think and sharing your theories and stuff with us. And on that note, do we have some more comments that we can bring up that we can questions or Assuming he was younger, would he have just stopped killing? He seems very angry. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. If it's not a sex crime, which we can't prove it is, it may have sexual elements, but we don't know that. Um, then it wouldn't have this, it wouldn't have the same sort of um, addictive element. It might have an addictive element, but I don't I think this guy's somewhere in the middle. I don't think he's he's one of these guys that has to do it all the time for the rest of his life. I don't think that he's someone who could just stop whenever he wants either. So, um, there for a while. And let's say that if we're talking about the patient, for example, after by police, he did leave the area and mm -hmm. traveled across the United States where police have been able to find other murders with similar motives. Yeah. But then again, I bet you if you, even if he didn't leave the state, you'd find similar murders to them as well. So unless there's physical evidence linking them, you know, if all of a sudden there was a, a DNA or a fingerprint or something else, um, that would be pretty powerful. An issue with me answering your question, Rebecca, is I'm thinking about these type of offenders and they, they don't usually go along without getting caught. The two offenders I mentioned to you, they didn't last more than a year each. So, and he could have could have died, could have gone to jail, any number of different things. Yeah, that as well. So yeah. it's interesting to think like how would how would his violence have progressed? Would he just have kept stabbing gay men? That you know, let's say he did start young because he's you know I think he did, and so he's gonna, he's gonna do this. 
for 30 years, or I, I think it's going to evolve, it, mustn't it? Which way does it evolve? Does he start then? I think what he starts then doing is maybe as he gets more resources, he starts bringing them um, to hotel rooms or back to his place or, or something like that where he can exercise more control. And maybe then he, he does the, the, you know, hey, let me tie you up thing. <laughs> maybe yeah. tortures them or something like that. So this is something we have to look for too. Like if he still keeps going, you're not looking for carbon copy cases. You're asking yourself, well, how would this evolve? Right. And does it, would this guy go from stabbing uh, potential mates, um, older white men, assuming the suspect is, is the one that did this. How likely is it for him to go from stabbing all these guys to becoming in relationships with them as he supposedly is now in a relationship. Um, would that be a, a normal transition? Well, uh, would that, would that very specific suspect, is that normal or would this unknown offender do that? Are we, are we talking about the suspect? We're, we're talking about the suspect that they have in mind yeah, that they well, say is in a relationship now. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, no, we know he's living openly as so that yeah. he's in a, and that's what I was getting at. I, I honestly think this is a case where the social climate did contribute to it. I, I think that uh, he felt lots of pressures from the intense social stigma of being gay. I really think that. And uh, if he would have tweaked a few things, he wouldn't have felt the same strains. I mean, that's a criminological concept there, strains, right? Um, and so all those would have been taken away. Um, still would have been a shitbag probably, but but not quite in that same way. So yeah, I think that as, as um, the social climate changed and it became more accepted, he, he might've just come to terms with it too. Right. Um, okay. So it's acceptable now and is able to admit it to himself. You have another question. Do we have any more speak pipes? Um, any more voicemails tonight? Ooh, I love the speak pipes. Yep. I guess we don't. So okay. why don't we talk a little bit about... Oh, here we go. Yeah, we got plenty more comments. Have there been any leaks slash clues of the suspect's identity? Asks M. Shingleton. Alex? Not, not that I'm aware of. I, I had a person reach out to me not too long ago um, and I, I knew very little about the Doodler case um, and I forget why this person reached out to me um, and they reached out with a suspect someone that they knew um, personally worked with um, and for some reasons I don't want to say he thought this guy could be the Doodler and when I looked at it and looked dug into this guy's information a little bit just to help him out so this guy's actually pretty interesting. Um, and he, he looked a lot like the sketch. So I actually passed this information on to Kevin Fagan. Um, mm. And for reasons, you know, I don't really want to get into, um, Kevin didn't think this was the right person. Um, and after what Kevin said, I, I don't think he was either. But it was interesting that this person had someone in mind that, that seemed uh, like a pretty reasonable suspect. Um, that's a bummer because I would have written up a I would have written up a proper profile for you. But now that I know about the young black guy, I can't do that without bias, so it's kind of useless. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Comment, comment, comment. Keep him coming. Comment. Speedball, son. Boom. Throw him down. Boom. 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 How about while we're uh, waiting for the comment, we talk a little bit about crime com. Sounds that would good. be cool. Why don't you start, Lee? Tell us a little bit about CrimeCon. Uh, okay. So, yeah, we want to tell you a bit about CrimeCon, the biggest convention in the world of true crime where thousands of people come together to discuss their favorite cases, rub elbows with some of the major players in the field, and interact with some of their favorite podcasters. CrimeCon, whoa, is a three-day event, and the next one is less than a year away. CrimeCon 2023 will be in Orlando, Florida at the World Center Marriott, September 22nd to September 24th. 
Yeah, I, I think I've talked about it in every episode. I've been to Crime Con since the very beginning. Everyone they have, it's it's tremendous. Um, it's a great time if you're into true crime. Uh, you can go there. You can talk to people that are just like you. They're not going to judge you. Uh, they're not going to say, "Hey, you're you're one of those weirdos that's in the true crime," because these are your people. Um, so, and you can rub elbows and talk to people like Nancy Grace and Paul Holes and Dr. Henry Lee. So really a great time. And if you're thinking about going, I'd say go and then uh, it'll be something you won't forget. And don't forget listeners and viewers of Citizen Detective can save 10% on standard back on 2023 with our promo code when you go to checkout. Crimecon.com and use the code Citizen Detective, all one word. And don't forget, book your trip now because the spot sell and we guarantee you're going to have an outstanding time and you might just see some of us. So, yeah, and Mark, you want to wrap up the show? Yeah, let's wrap it up. Well, um, so, going to the scrum. Yeah, we, we definitely don't want you to forget the scrum and, and, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the the terminology, the scrum, in in the scrum. Um, <laughs> so when when we get there, I'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. We have to be a DDA member and get in there to hear what uh, hear what it is. But anyhow, uh, um, as we are wrapping up uh, and heading to the scrum, uh, we're going to talk more about the doodler. But we want uh, patrons to come on over. We'll see everyone here in two weeks. And that's when we head to Houston, Texas for the 2000 Mary Morris murders. This is a really interesting case. Two women, both named Mary Morris were found dead in their cars, four days apart, both remote areas. And was this a coincidence or an assassination gone wrong? The wrong person targeted where you're going to have to tune in to find out as we go over that case. Cloyd will be in the scrum with us too. Cloyd's going to be joining us. Yeah, can't get enough Cloyd. And uh, more of your questions and comments, too. Yeah, so come on over and join us. Let's head there now. Patricia Burns says, I always expect to see the chat have to be put in slow mode. It's baffling that this is not huge. Yeah, I'm baffled also. <laughs> What's she, what's she getting like at? I think she's she's surprised that our show chat 